Dr. Smith, thank you for joining us. How are you this evening? I'm doing great, Pat. Good. Thanks for having me. Good. We so appreciate your time. So you've, I don't know if you were able to listen in, but we've just talked about dystrophin expressing therapies. And I'm going to back up before I ask you my question about that. But I think that, you know, in the 2018 care considerations, what we saw is the mean age of death changed and added 10 years of life to these young boys. And that was employing known medical tools, um, steroids, steroid regimen, cardiac medicines, uh, pulmonary care, physical therapy, et cetera. So with these dystrophin expressing compounds and certainly with the gene therapies, are you seeing the curve change as well? Are you seeing as you see these patients that things are once again changing toward long, yeah, better trajectory of longer ambulation, better pulmonary function tests for longer periods of time? Wow. Um, well, Pat, my honest answer is I don't know at this point. I still think it's 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 a bit early, um, and um, and you're right. I mean, we've we've made we've made strides with with improved care and improved cardiopulmonary care uh, in the absence of any dystrophin replacement. Um, uh, but of course, this is this is the big this is the big question. If we if we can begin to help uh, our boys and young men make some form of dystrophin, some functional form of dystrophin, uh, in whatever amount, the, the hope would be that we would that we would shift things even further over to the milder milder side, and then uh, improve quality of life, improve um, function, uh, or at least help maintain function even longer. Um, I, uh, I, there are a lot of um, factors that will figure into how effective that approach is. Um, how much of the dystrophin does the treatment allow the boy to make? At what stage of Duchenne are you intervening? What's what's the condition of of the muscle at the point when you introduce this these treatments? Um, you know, um, and and then also very importantly, what is the quality of the dystrophin that a particular treatment allows uh, the allows a patient to make. Um, we, we don't really have, you know, when we talk about gene replacement therapy or, or exon skipping, it's really important to remember that these are not normal um, uh, uh, full-length dystrophin proteins that are being made. They're, they're shortened versions, and, and, and they're going to be less effective than full-length dystrophin will be. Um, and again, it's being introduced at some point uh, well into the disease course. So, so I, you know, I, I, I'm kind of jumping ahead. I don't think I answered your question very well, but, but these are the things that I think about, um, uh, how much, how much dystrophin and what's the quality of that dystrophin and, and what's the capacity of the muscle at that point in time, when you introduce this treatment to, to respond, uh, to dystrophin, to, for that dystrophin to have something to, to latch onto and have a functional impact. Yeah, I think it's so hard, right? And I think one of the other questions that parents are asking, um, in fact, just the other day I had a mom call who said, you know, I have a young boy, gene therapy studies are underway. He's also amenable to Exxon 51 skipping. So how do I think about that, right? A and how do you think about that in terms of can you layer these therapies on? Would you? What would you need to know in order to think gene therapy and then an exon skipping product um, after that? How? How? What would you need to do, know as a clinician to be able to prescribe something like that? Well, you know, first and foremost is always safety, right? And 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 I um, just based on what we know right now, I, I don't know why there would necessarily be a considerable safety. Um, uh, uh, concern by combining those two therapeutic approaches, um, and uh, you know, in, in theory, they, they should they should work synergistically as well, and they're not going to combat each other. Um, uh, one will make mini or micro dystrophin, and, and the other um, uh, the other will uh, uh, help make skip uh, fifty one skip dystrophin. Um, you know, one question I have, and I think many people have, is back to this quality question, is what's the quality of, of a skipped dystrophin? We know it's a much longer 
dystrophin protein than the mini or micro dystrophin uh, that's being produced through gene replacement therapy. But, but you know, those, those gene replacement therapy constructs are, were based on patients out in the world who had very short dystrophin molecules, but really relatively mild Becker muscular dystrophy. So, um, so the size of the protein is not the only thing, um, uh, but it, but it may it may be important. So, um, so I, I you know I, I don't I don't know the answer to that, Pat. I think we'll learn as we go. Um, um, but at this point, I, I don't see a reason why they would be somehow mutually exclusive. One one big hurdle, the big hurdle, that oftentimes if if you're if you find the safety acceptable and think there might be a reasonable chance for additional benefit from combined therapy is, is then getting it, getting it covered by, by a payer, right. Um, uh, and convincing, say, and I'm talking outside of a trial, uh, convincing a payer to, to, to pay for the two treatments together. Cause as we all know, these are not, these are not cheap therapies. Um, yeah, I think we're all struggling with that, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think that, you know, obviously if you have one or the other therapy first or participate in a, in a gene therapy, should there be approval, how can, what are payers going to do to look at that therapy that will be incredibly expensive? Although from the parent side of things, you know, getting dystrophin expressed is sort of like the holy grail, right? And then thinking about a gene therapy with a microdystrophin to add to or supplement or synergize with that dystrophin protein would be pretty incredible um, opportunity right. at least I think we'd all we'd all think that and hope it would really change what's ha happening in terms of progression so we're working on newborn screening I, I mean I'm very hopeful there'll be a day when we can think about a baby and in diagnosing very early and then intervening I also think that you know there's there's a I worry a lot about the language we use change Duchenne to Becker because I think we're changing Duchenne right we want we want to get those three flavors of uh, of um, outcomes that you talk about this slowing progression stopping progression or providing benefit so um would you treat a baby with an, a weekly antisense oligonucleotide um i i, I would I, I i think that we have a lot of progress yet to make uh with the ASOs, and there there are so many um, promising and interesting um, programs in the pipeline that that really seem to have potential to uh, induce more exon skipping and and then you know produce more dystrophin and and then hopefully have more effect. Um, current, you know, my current thought is that um, that as far as dystrophin replacement strategies go, and I, you know, this may end up being incorrect, but um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic in the short term with gene replacement therapy, therapy approach in terms of amount of dystrophin, importantly, amount of mini or micro dystrophin. That's one thing, it's one thing I always try to bring up. We, we talk about dystrophin replacement, but it's very important to remember that these are not normal dystrophin molecules. Mm -hmm. And to your point about Becker, it's well taken. Um, you know, we're, we're learning to use this term dystrophinopathy, I think, um, more and more. Uh, and um, in, in those terms, I guess what we would be talking about is shifting towards a milder form of, of dystrophinopathy. Uh, and the quality of the product and the quality of dystrophin that's made is, is key to that, but also as you just mentioned, the, the age, the age at which therapy is introduced. Uh, I, uh, I, so I, I would not, I would not rule out uh, um, uh, prescribing uh, exon skipping therapy to a patient. And if a family came to me and, and um, was was um, very strongly pursuing that, I would, I would not say no. I think many providers would not say no, um, but. Um, getting, you know, getting that approved, getting it covered, and, 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 and it is another, potentially another, another story. Um, I, I would also say that, you know, we, you mentioned a while back about uh, exon skipping and in, 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 the, in the era of gene therapy trials. And, and so for that family who has a boy who's exon 51 skip amenable, 
um, but also looking hard at, at, at trying to get into a gene replacement um, uh, trial. Um, you know, uh, being on the exon skipping therapy is not necessarily exclusive. There, there were just, uh, I think, the programs I'm aware of do allow a washout period. So the fact that you started or were on uh, an exon skipping drug, but you would have to come, your child would have to come off of that uh, to be to be eligible for the current slate of, of trials that are available or are hopefully soon to be available. But one day, hopefully combination therapies, right, where we can treat with exon skipping or a microdystrophin and then lead right back into the next gene expression there, you know, the next um, dystrophin expression therapy. Well, I think it's right. And I think that there's some analogies here to the spinal muscular atrophy world. These are not, none of the things we're talking about are cures. I, I think we can talk about approaching that um, as we intervene earlier with, with more effective therapies. But, you know, there's always going to be that need and that desire to do more and, and on top of, uh, on top of um, the current standard of care. So um, I, I don't see any way around in the near future. I don't see any way around uh, uh, combining, uh, combining therapies. But again, not to harp on this, but the, I think the key at the end of all of this is going to be to convince um, payers to, to, to pay for that. And, and they will want to see evidence that that additional treatment provides additional benefit on top right. of, of the baseline therapy. Right. Well, we have to convince payers. We have to do the work that we need to do to see it yeah. and then convince payers. I'm so grateful for all you do. Thank you for spending time for us after probably a long and busy day. So we hope to see you <laughs> next pleasure. year in person. Thanks. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. Good, Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye.